Hi, welcome to the next of our series of mini lectures where we're going to be looking at how a zoom lens works and understand optics in the context of designing a zoom lens. We've already come up with some conceptual and mathematical models of how light works. We've looked at the behavior of lenses and we're going to start to develop one of several possible mathematical models describing how imaging systems work today. Uh, to describe imaging systems, we're going to work in the context of a zoom lens, and we saw last time that this is a simple zoom lens with two positive focal length lenses and one negative focal length uh, lens arranged here, where on the left side in the usual position we have an object that emits rays of light, and this zoom lens, if it works properly, is going to create an image of this object at an image plane, which would be film or a CCD array or something like that. Um, we went through this last time and we saw that the rays of light that come off of points on the object plane, here we have a red point and a blue point, uh, hit the first lens, are bent. The rays traveling in new directions hit the second negative lens. They're again deflected and hit the third lens and then form a real image on the image plane, a real image because all the rays of light that start at a point are going to meet at the point over on this side. Um, one way to calculate this, a uh, uh, rather brute force way, would be simply to apply Snell's law at every single surface of the lens. Uh, mathematically, this would be quite tedious to do by hand, but in fact, this is what ray tracing programs, and this is the output of a ray tracing program that we'll be using later in the course, uh, but this is what ray tracing programs do. These are exact and mathematical and really propagate or will really propagate rays through an optical system on a surface-by-surface -surface basis. Uh, but we need something to really come up with the design of a lens, something to see how a lens behaves without having to do sort of a brute force computer-generated uh, trial and error or guessing approach. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So to derive our mathematical model, or to describe the math mathematical model since the derivation we've already done, we're going to use a two-lens system where we have an object in the usual position on the left. We assume that we're going to form an image somewhere on the right, and we have a spacing between two lenses, uh, focal length f1 and f2. I've drawn them as positive lenses here, but they can equally well be negative lenses. And this is the optical system we're developing. And we know how to write equations for this optical system, so let's pop those up. Uh, this is the standard Gaussian lens equation. Uh, we know that the object at a distance SO1 from the lens with focal length 1 is going to form an image uh, some distance S image 1 away from the lens and we can calculate that uh, using our Gaussian lens formula. But that doesn't tell us what to do with the second lens unless we realize that an image created by the first lens acts like an object for the second lens and that's a very very important point and so let's highlight that point right over here, and I'll say it again. For systems of multiple lenses, the image of the previous lens serves as the object for the second lens. And once we realize that the image formed right here from the first lens is the object for the second lens, now we know the object distance for the second lens, we know the focal length, and we can calculate the image distance. So we do that by simply realizing that this distance here, SO2, is simply the spacing between the lenses, D1, subtracted by the image distance here. Or the object distance is D1 minus the image distance. We plug that in, we can calculate the image distance, and we can continue with this iterative procedure for as many lenses as we have in an optical system. Um, notice that your book goes ahead and combines these to make polynomial equations. For two lenses, you have a first-order polynomial equation. For three lenses, you have a second-order polynomial equation. For four lenses, you'll come up with a third-order polynomial equation, and so on and so forth. But beyond two lenses, the tedium of solving all this algebra is really boring, and it's much better just to do this in an iterative process as I've shown here. Now you can say, gee, uh, this sounds really good, but not every optical system has the image in front of the second lens. And let's take a look at a slight modification to the system where we bring the object a little bit closer. In this case, our image actually forms behind the second lens, and that can't work, can it? Well, in fact, it does, uh, because you'll see that basically um, the image distance in this case is very large, and if we subtract the D1 minus our image distance, SO2 comes out to be a negative number uh, because SI1 is bigger than D1. And in fact, this is a 
uh, negative distance for this lens. And we can go ahead and plug this in even if the image is formed behind the second lens in the system. Uh, it also works if you have a virtual image, if no real image is formed. For example, if we bring this in closer beyond the focal length f1, now we have a virtual image out here. Uh, in this case, the math still works out because uh, SI1 is a negative number, and D1 minus a negative number is the same as this distance D1 plus SI1 right here. And that, in fact, gives you the correct value for the object distance 2. So it turns out, although it's somewhat unintuitive, that this polynomial approach, just iteratively plugging in the object distance from the first lens to calculate the image distance from the second lens, given the spacing between, carrying down for the second lens and third lens, third lens and fourth lens, and so on, works very well um, and is a very good approach to calculate image systems.